Unfortunately, many children experience trauma, whether it be from abuse, neglect, homelessness, domestic violence, or witnessing violence in their communities. Our adolescent years are perhaps the most tender years of our development, both mentally and physically, and it is the events in these years that shape our vision of the world around us. I want children in Guyana to have a better view of the world. So many of them deserve to live a better life, and I believe through sports and physical activity that they can do this. My interest and love for sport has opened up my eyes to the world of possibilities, in that it contributes positively to a child's personal development by strengthening and building both mental and physical health. What is a trauma? So trauma is anything that has happened to someone, um, an event that has left, in most cases, a negative impact on their self, on their psyche. It may involve a physical attack. It might be something like cyberbullying. It doesn't have to be. I think a lot of persons think of a trauma as like a full-blown, excessive um, incident. But I, you can be traumatized by being mugged. You can be traumatized by being bullied. You can be traumatized by having people gossip about you all the time, which is a form of bullying. And I think that people don't understand how hurtful small things can be. And a lot of times, um, why persons aren't able to just get over it is because trauma affects people differently. One trauma may affect me in a different way than it might affect you. And the problem with that is that if we don't have enough practitioners or we don't have people being sensitive to how impactful a trauma can be, we're not really able to get the support we need. If we have people saying, oh, just get over it, we're less likely to seek out help. And the less likely we are to seek out help is the less likely we are to get over it. I am an educator for 36 years. And I've taught at a wide cross-sections of school in Guyana from the interior location to the coastland. And during my journey, because I will call it a journey, because I haven't gotten to the destination as yet. During my journey as a teacher, I have encountered impact lives, and many of them birthed out of trauma. A traumatic life in a child will not tell you or call you and say, I'm experiencing such. It is which you as the teacher, because you are, have grown yourself, you're able to pick it up. You're going to see a withdrawn child. You're going to see a silent child, an anxious child, a child who is fearful of even answering a simple question if being asked, or a child who is aggressive. And those behaviors are birthed from experiences, and those are negative experiences, which we define as traumatic or trauma, because it is fear, it is trauma is an, a result of fear and anxiety. In Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, he talks about a pyramid of needs that person need to reach self-actualization. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you have food, clothing, shelter, and those basic needs. But in order to reach self-actualization, you also need the esteem and belonging um, needs supplied. And many children, especially those who have been neglected, those in the orphanages, they get the basic needs. And they don't have anybody to form a bond or relationship with. So it affects their self-esteem. It affects the way they interact with persons. And it affects the way that they cope and deal with the various issues that they experience in life. Childhood trauma is a silent dictator in the lives of many youth across the world. Here in Guyana, we lack the resources to truly help many of those who experienced traumatic events in their childhood. However, slowly, we are moving towards education, policy implementation, mitigation, and eventually, hopefully, eradication. After looking at the options for treatment of mental health issues, we found that treatments either go on the side of antidepressants or medication to help control symptoms. Medication which have side effects that can be detrimental and only pose as a temporary relief. 
Coupled with therapy, it can have a bit more longevity, but this is still a temporary treatment option. This brings us to our ideal intervention. Allow me to introduce you to the healthy, holy approach. Guyana Golden Lives Organization provides support while addressing the multitude of challenging issues following the death of a loved one. And Miss World Guyana 2018 Queen, she is addressing trauma in childhood. And like grief, it's a very traumatic event. So we have been partnering to provide support for the children, especially those who have been experiencing some, for, some form of trauma beyond grief. And her program is an excellent one because she's using sport to promote healing. And like one of the objectives of my organization, even though we are providing support, the main goal is to promote healing. And we also have an aspect where we do play therapy and it fits perfectly with a healthy, holy approach of using sport to address the various mental health issues that arises from trauma. It was introduced to basically all sports discipline that we have in Guyana that we push, which was uh, table tennis, swimming, soccer. We had general fitness, which I personally teach. Uh, we had a little bit of boxing. We had basketball. We had football. So they basically got a good idea how to play the sport. We gave them, left them at least with an idea of what to do with a sport is concerned. But initially when we went in, we didn't know what to expect. Because again, this is a, a area that we, I thought was neglected. So you really don't know what to expect dealing with special need children. Um, I, when I went there, first from my experience, the kids was uh, receptive. I was shocked. Um, I thought they would have been a little bit more withdrawn being that they're classified as special needs, but I thought they were more enthusiastic than kids who didn't suffer from special needs, to be honest with you. Given the energy and given the attention, these kids were so receptive. I thought there was a lack of neglect initially, and once, they sh once we showed them that we were very interested in sp getting them into sports and Ms. Ambika was very passionate about what we was trying to do, you will find that they was like, wow, someone cares and they came completely to life. Like the couple that was a little, as they went on and we see that they saw that we wasn't washy-washy with what we was about, they completely bought him. And I was so happy to see the ones who were a little sad at the beginning start smiling at week two. At week five, the ones who was a little withdrawn was actually getting me the balls to play. So it was very rewarding to be a part of that. Me, what I saw, it showed them that they're not forgotten, that there are Guyanese and the country is doing something for them. Um, it's unfortunate that, the, that it's not always continuous and it took Ambika to actually win a trophy, a crown to actually bring attention to this, but it, the attention is here. Uh, to give the kids exposure to stuff that they might have seen on TV, a kid coming from a, a challenging environment, again, it just let them know that they're not forgotten that anything is possible, no matter where you're from. Schools and other organizations, they provide basic needs for these children, which is either food, clothing, shelter, but they don't reach the esteem needs and the belonging needs. And this program provides that sort of support. So the partnership we will have is definitely a long-term something. I see it's not a touch and go because we will be forming a relationship with the children. We'll be partnering them with mentors so that they can cope, grow, and develop into their best selves. Chess has always been seen as a game for the intellectuals. But for me, I think that chess is for all ages and different mindsets. Um, I believe that if you give everyone a chance, regardless of their background, or uh, their age. I believe that once you reach out to them and give them the opportunity that they can do anything. Chess helps a person to be able to think more strategically. Uh, as I told some of the kids when we were playing, before you make a move, think, is it a good move? And when the opponent makes a move, think, why did he play there? So strategizing. From chess, you're able to get that. 
It also helps to stimulate the brain, help with memory retention, help you to focus some more, helps with the schoolwork or when you get out there in the workplace. So those are some of the benefits of playing chess. Go in there and uh, introducing chess to them. To be honest, I thought they might not be interested in the game. You know, it wasn't told in advance that someone would be coming there to teach them chess. So I thought, truly thought that I would have maybe a few of them, maybe five, six the most. What surprised me was the interest. And at the end of it, we had about 17 or 18 of them understanding the game thoroughly and wanting to learn more. And also, what I found that they were very helpful, kind, loving kids, you know, and they, they were just waiting for someone to just, you know, help them along, guide them, take them to the next level. They are very eager to learn and they are very um, excited to learn. We see some of them come just afraid to put their head in the water or put their feet. But um, at the end of the program now, they are swimming, jumping, they are treading. They could save their own life. They could swim from one side of the 25 meter pool to the other side. So we are um, enjoying that and we really feel good that um, we could make an impact in, in their lives in that way. And we see some of them who also I would love to continue training and see um, what is the real true potential and push them to be among other um, competitive swimmers. We have some um, children, especially one of them who stand out very much because I see that he holds his breath underwater for an average but over two minutes and that's something that I really I knew to do. It makes me want to challenge him because that, that's one of the things that um, I love doing. The program highlights the importance of the link that exists between your mental and physical facets of health. It takes into account how one's deterioration can affect the other and aims to maintain that balance while also giving these youth a tool to cope with the stresses of their lives. I have seen the intervention of sports in the lives of youths, children, even adults brought out the best in them. Sports not only allow you to become a team player, it also releases the right hormones to make you laugh. And, and when you have a release of dopamine in your body, joy, peace, happiness, forgiveness, because in sports you have to, ha you have to be able to forgive because you may accidentally trip someone, you give them a hand. So it not only builds teamwork, but it helps to build relationship. And when we can have our school or our peers built on a strong foundation of sports, where they know that each to win, we each win in order for the team to win, it's a very good thing because winning is not an event. It's an activity. It's a lifestyle. So when we ground our children in sports, and that's a beautiful thing, when we can pull them together, you know this is our team. We win when each of us win. As an appointed head for Houston Suck Marriage, I, I have to give the name of the school, I visited the school and I really wasn't comfortable with what I was seeing among the students. Their aggressive behavior, they will fight each other, they're going to take weapons, you're going to have to search the bag for weapons and so. So I, I decided now to examine my misdemeanor book and to see what was the pattern of the behavior arising out of the school. Upon doing so, I recognized that many of the young men who was caught up during the crime spree that Guyana was experiencing, 
that, uh, that were students, some of them were students of Houston, and their names were already in that book so many times, taken to the welfare office, and they still turned out to become prominent criminals. And it alarmed me because I'm saying as a head teacher, those were warning signs. Those were signs that teachers should have picked up on. These are indications that these children are crying out for help. They want somebody to notice them. They want somebody to help them. They want somebody to say, I got you until you got yourself. I believe in you until you believe in yourself. I Come talk with me. Let us talk. What is going on? Why is it that you are doing what you are doing? And I decided then, during my tenure, my stay at Houston, that I promised myself and God that we are going to make a difference in the lives of these children who are now in our care. And we did. We started to talk to them. We started to, every Monday and Friday at assembly, we begin to tell them how blessed they are that they have seeds of greatness planted in them, that they are the best. They have each come into the world for a purpose. And if they do not fulfill their purpose in the world, the world is being robbed. So we start speaking into their character, start speaking values. Instead of punishing, we use reverse psychology for them to understand how their negative behaviors were affecting others, themselves, and their community. I also had an experience with a young man, always misbehaving, fighting with others, beating up on the children. I called him in my office and I said, what's going on? Talk to me, what is going on? And he started to cry and he said, miss, I do not have my father's name. And it was like, oh my God, moment. Many a times we do not understand what these children are going through. I can remember pre um, one day there was a young man. He was brought to my office because of a misbehavior. Um, one of the, the behavior was not right for school. So I sat there and I started to talk to him. At that time, during that rampage of criminal activities, you always see the faces of those dead men being shot and plastered in the front page of the newspaper, which was not a good sight. And I told him, I called him by name, and I said, I do not want to see your handsome face across any newspaper. And those words impacted him greatly. He got up from my chair, <laughs> from the chair. He ran out of my office, came back with a few of his friends, and he said, Miss, you tell them what you just told me. Tell them what you just told me, Miss. Tell them. And he was so excited because I called him handsome. All because I told him that I do not want to see his handsome face. And that word meant a lot to him. It, it boosted his ego. And you know from then on, we never had that kind of trouble with him. In addition to having your trauma go undealt with is people ask, you know, why do we have this suicide epidemic, why do we have this mental health epidemic? It is solely connected to the unstable mental health that we have in Guyana. So if you're not dealing with your trauma and you start to suffer from PTSD and you're able to, to function, but you can tell that your, your mental health is becoming you know, under attack and you're not functioning on a daily basis and you start to develop phobias and you start to develop anxiety and depression, Depression is directly linked in many cases to suicide attempts and suicide ideation. So if we want to start questioning what can we do about the suicide epidemic, we have to become more aware of what role mental health, our own mental health, plays in the suicide epidemic and being able to say, yes, this is a problem. My mental health is a problem. I am feeling depressed. 
And this is as a result of this trauma I didn't deal with two weeks ago, two years ago, 12 years ago. I, I truly believe that traumas don't ever fully leave us unless we process it. And I truly believe a lot of Guyanese are walking around with post-traumatic stress disorder because we have not dealt with the countless traumas, whether small or large. Um, do you ever really get over being raped or molested? No. To be honest, you don't. Um, the slightest thing triggers your memory. Um, for me, um, like for years back in my early 20s, um, I was in an abusive relationship and I chose to stay in that abusive relationship for like seven years because I just felt as though um, I needed to be there. I wanted... I wanted to be loved and because he was hitting me it means he loved me or he cared about me because nobody else cared about me and stuff like this. I think there are so many issues that is associated that is associated to being raped or molested at an early age. And it's just so like I'm not a counselor, I'm like a, I'm not a psychiatrist, so like I can't really I mean <laughs> they might be able to more explain, but I can only explain like how I feel. And the thing is, like I said, anything triggers you is like for me like um milk like simple milk like triggers me like i don't use milk cuz i remember that when um when i was when i was small and i was being molested those are one of the things that my uncle would use to like molest me oh do you want some milk well if you want some milk then you got to do so and so to get some milk so like every time i see milk milk triggers me like takes me back right away so um then Oh my god. Stop. In primary school I used to act out in primary school. I was always I was always the rude kid. I was always the one not listening. But then my teachers them never used to understand why. Like every time my grand because I grew up with my grandmother. My mother used to live with us, but my grandmother was one who would take care of me because my mother was always busy working and stuff. So every time my grandmother would go to the school and the teachers would be like, um, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. She's such a bright child. She's always bring. She's always coming first in class. She's always in every competition, spelling bee competition, reading competition. I'm always doing everything, but they don't know why they're getting the attitude. Why I'm always rude and why I'm always, you know, why I always want to skip school. Why I always want to be late for school. Why I always want to walk out of class. And they just didn't understand. But now as I get older, I think I. I kind of understand maybe that was the reason why I was acting out in school and why I was behaving in that manner so but back then I didn't understand because I didn't know what was happening I was like I said I was very much confused as a person that kind of trauma really um, affects your life as a child as an adult um, it's a continuous co um, continuous coping mechanism that you have to that you you gotta have put in place um you like i said you tend to every now and again something will come along that triggers you um i don't know i can't say because what works for me might not work for others so i can't necessarily pinpoint what it is you should do or shouldn't do but it does is 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 something that you're for, that you're forever dealing with something that is always there and I don't even know how to advise or how to advise you best in dealing with it other than just knowing that you are not the only person out there Everybody I've known like two like three out of five of my friends have been molested and raped So it's not something that not a trauma that you alone is battling every day with but your friend you have a cousin They might not talk about it or they might not say anything to anybody about it, but Probably your sister your cousin your friend Your mom your grandmother is something that they're dealing with daily as well. So you're definitely not alone Some of the children, they have experienced neglect, abuse, some physical, some sexual. Some of them have experienced some form of bereavement also. So this has caused an impairment in some important functioning of their lives.
And um, this program has been addressing these things and identifying and offering a way for the children to escape the encompassing feelings that the trauma might have caused. So coping mechanisms are really important for our day in, day out functioning and the well-being of our mental health. I think people don't really understand what we mean coping mechanisms. So coping mechanisms are anything that we do that helps us feel stress relief, helps bring down anxiety, helps us um, kind of maintain our health and overall health in many times. Now there are negative and positive coping mechanisms and some of the po positive coping mechanisms that youth tend to kind of gravitate towards is usually things like sports, sports activities, um, engaging in a sports team. And why is that important? If a sports program is to be done in a holistic manner, so we're not just talking about the sporting activity itself, but the life skills classes, like if you can engage a student in life skills, um, uh, training and topics, peer pressure and drug use and developing trust and self-esteem, those things are integral and should be included in sports programming. Things like talking about hygiene, sitting down with boys and explaining to them what it's like to be a man and some of the challenges men go through in society. Same thing for women, going through a lot of things like body changes. So making sports activities and making sports programming holistic is important for the overall development of youth. Any kind of engagement like the sports, dance, um, Cub Scouts, Scouts. I used to be a Cub Scout and I used to be a dancer and here I am a psychologist. So clearly my mental health has been kept intact by activities. Our program saw 50 plus kids being involved in various sports and activities. Some they were familiar with and others they were completely new to. And many of them even formed a love for one sport or another. The children not only found a love, but discovered a talent in areas they may not have been able to without this program. I would like for us to continue the program, holistic, not just with this group, but for groups coming in, just to give them the exposure and let them build, you know, build friends, build gaps, just to be out there as a whole, but for the Sports Commission, I can say that we could commit at least once a week. I would like it to be more, it might be more in the future, but I know I'm committing myself to once a week to go in there and continue the sports activity that we started. Trauma causes a dip in any person's mental health. And some persons are resilient and some are not. And especially children who don't even know what trauma is, cannot even identify the emotions that they're going through. What I've seen with the Healthy Holy program, it has given them those skills to be resilient. It's given them those skills to express themselves, to reach out to persons, to form relationships. Um, and it is amazing because for the times that I visited the program and saw how Ambika and the other volunteers interacted with the children, it was definitely something you know will be long term and it will have an impact on their lives. The changes that we saw in these children's lives would have never been possible had it not been for my team that worked diligently with me to help see this program into fruition. I would like to thank the Miss World Ghana organization, my mom, and every individual and company that came on board to make this program a success. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. And to my kids, I love you so much and you've made such an impact on me and I'm sure on all the lives that would have crossed paths with yours. So thank you for everything that you've taught me and everything that you will continue to teach me as time goes on.